Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm sure we'll have a few more people joining us in the next couple of minutes, but I'm really glad to have each one of you here. My name is Janellen DeLamba. I'm Director of PrimeWise and Volunteer Services here at St. Elizabeth. And I, along with Monica Bronwerk, the PrimeWise Coordinator, really wish to welcome you to Menopause 101, Building the Foundation and Beyond, Between You and Me on Beyond. Uh, but i um, very, very pleased to have you join us. Uh, as you noticed, as you signed on, this uh, presentation is being recorded and uh, the link will be added to our PrimeWise webpage or our homepage, landing page, whichever one you wanna call it, uh, it next week. Uh, so we will also send out uh, an email letting you know that it has been posted on our webpage. Now I have gone ahead and muted everyone uh, here because of the recording. Uh, so, um, so we appreciate uh, and want to make sure that we uh, go ahead and that we capture your questions. So you certainly can type a question anytime into the chat box and it can be uh, privately to Dr. Oakley. Uh, <clears throat> and I believe she's on here as Susan Oakley or um, to everyone, either way, we'll um, try to make sure that we address uh, your questions and uh, we'll likely open it up at the very end. But um, in the meantime, if you can use the chat box for your questions, that will be perfect. Uh, additionally, uh, for those of you that haven't already done this, please uh, type your name into the chat box. Uh, again, this is for uh, attendance purposes because um, the device you're signing in on doesn't always uh, match up with the email address for our attendance. So we appreciate uh, being able to make that connection. Uh, and again, you can do that privately. You can um, send a chat either to myself, I'm listed there as PrimeWise, or to Monica, who's listed as Monica, uh, or to everyone. Uh, that will help us immensely. So we really appreciate you doing that. Uh, a little bit before we get started, there are a couple of upcoming PrimeWise uh, programs in November and some screenings that I'd like to highlight for you. On November the 3rd, we have a screening, uh, Managing Your Medications. And that's where uh, members of our pharmacy team, uh, they this is a by appointment, so you do have to call in and, and schedule an appointment. And uh, you're asked to bring in everything that you're taking. Um, whether it's over the counter, it's a, a herbal supplement, it's a prescription medication, bring them all in and you get to sit down with a pharmacist and they'll review them all with you when you're taking them, what's the best time to take them, uh, if there's any potential uh, side effects or things that you might be experiencing. And, and while you probably can do that at your pharmacy, you can't sit down next to somebody and have them uh, give you their undivided oh. attention. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and mute you, Paula. Um, thank you. I'm going to keep everybody muted throughout um, the presentation uh, until the end. Um, so uh, please consider uh, if you've got questions, you know, am I taking this right? Um, uh, please. Uh, feel free to call in to the PrimeWise office and schedule an appointment. These happen to be at our Fort Thomas location. Then on November the 9th, we have what matters most is what, um, what you want, uh, advanced care planning. So if you have not done an, advan uh, an advanced care plan, uh, or an advanced directive, uh, or uh, a living will, you really might want to tune into this. Now, this is a virtual program. And we strongly encourage you to uh, start, you know, just because you're um, writing down what you might want, it's when you can't speak for yourself. And uh, it's ensuring that your wishes will be honored. And it also will take a burden off of your family members in trying to read your mind. So strongly encourage you, if you don't already have an advanced directive, sign up for our virtual program on the 9th. And finally, November 13th, uh, the Melanoma No More uh, team uh, throughout um, Greater Cincinnati is offering a free skin cancer screening. Uh, and this, again, is on November the 13th. Again, you must have an appointment. There are no walk-ins. Uh, and you can call, uh, can call the office. Or if you have still have the update, there's a, a registration line there number as well. 
Um, it's a great opportunity. If you haven't been to a dermatologist for a while, come. Uh, and they'll, they'll do a, um, you can choose to have a full body scan and uh, they'll check um, you for any type of blemishes or moles that you might have. It's a, a, it's a great peace of mind. Take advantage of it. So thanks for listening to my commercial. I appreciate it, my PrimeWise commercial. Um, and um, I, I think I've mentioned to everybody, we're gonna keep you muted, how to make sure you get your questions answered. And I um, appreciate you typing your, uh, your name into the chat box. Uh, and um, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Susan Oakley. She is, a Euro, uh, she is the uni, Eurogynecology lead physician with St. Elizabeth Physicians Women's Health uh, she's also the vice chair of the St. Elizabeth Physicians Board of Directors. She has her medical degree from the Medical School for International Health at Ben Gurion University at the Negev in collaboration with Columbia University Medical Center, uh, which was through New York in New York City. Uh, she's certified both through the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology, as well as the American Board of Female Pelvic Medicine and Reconstructive Surgery. She is the author of far too many professional articles and presentations for uh, me to even begin to count, let alone mention. Uh, she's the host of the popular podcast, Lady Bod. And if you have not listened to that, you're in for a treat. Uh, and um, probably she might say even more, most importantly, she's the mother of two adorable, I said little girls, but now they're six and four, so they're growing up. And she's an overall fabulous presenter. So um, at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Dr. Oakley. Now that will take us just a moment here virtually. Well, thank you for that amazing introduction. None of it is deserved at all, but thank you. Um, being a mom is, is my favorite job. So um, let me see if I can successfully share my screen with everyone. And then is that working? And if it doesn't work, that's okay. You tell me, Janelle, and if you can it's see it. It's flashing. It, um, is it? Looks like it's flash. Try again. Okay. Let's see. If I. Okay. We've only been working on this for an hour. <laughs> there it is. And if I move through it, um, does it also move for, for y'all? And it may not. Is that working now? It's working perfect. Okay, great. So well, if y'all can see me, hear me, see the slides, fantastic. I know that Rita was having some trouble with audio, so I was trying to give Rita some hot tips in the in the chat box. So hopefully, Rita and everyone else, we are good uh, on audio and visual now. Um, so uh, I'll go ahead and get started. And like Janelle and Monica said, if y'all have any questions, please feel free to just type them into the chat box and I will kind of glance my eyes over throughout the presentation virtually to check the, the messages from time to time. Um, always happy to see your faces if you wanna put yourself on video so I get a chance to see who I'm talking to. Um, so I know Norma put her face up there. So welcome Norma, thank you for letting me see you. Um, and uh, we are here to talk about menopause today and Janelle and I were just laughing about our hot flashes. So without further ado, let's get started in talking about menopause. Um, so we're building the foundation today. I got a wonderful introduction, so I hope I can give y'all as good of an introduction to menopause. We'll always start with a funny cartoon because I love laughter and I love demystifying really intimate discussions about women's health. As a urogynecologist, we don't just cover menopause, but we do cover sexuality, intimacy, 
wetting your pants, pooping on yourself. And these are fun topics for me, but not always fun for everyone else to talk about. And so we do want to start with humor to, again, just take the stigma away, loosen everybody up. Um, and I love this uh, meme because it says menopause really isn't that bad. Said no woman ever. But like all of us listening today, there are moments where we can kind of reflect back on our first period and maybe it wasn't a bad experience or our first engagement in sexual activity and it wasn't painful or our first childbirth and it was easy. Uh, so a lot of our discussion today is variable, uh, but I still want to try and standardize it to cover as many of our uh, listeners as possible. So we will go through some background information first and then move through some diagnosis um, uh, modalities and treatment options. I always like to let y'all know that I have no financial disclosures. Uh, I do um, work uh, freely and for, for no financial gain through uh, Pure Romance, who has a 501c nonprofit organization to raise money and grants for research and women's uh, health, particularly uh, in the realm of menopause and perimenopausal women, uh, but really no financial disclosures. So our background information, we just really need to start with what is menopause? Most women will start to transition in their uh, mid to late 40s, but the average age of menopause is 51. Now, 51 just is the average. So some of us can start sooner. Some of us can have menstrual cycles after the age of 51 and go through menopause later. Um, but really any activity with menopause before the age of 40 is considered abnormal. It can be genetic. It can be associated with other things like you're getting chemo or radiation or other cancer treatments, or you had to have uh, early menopause surgically by removing your ovaries or uterus. Uh, so there are these other factors listed up on the slide, but traditionally menopause starts in your 40s. Average age that you completed is 51, but it can last past 51. And so some of the symptoms of menopause are systemic, right? I always like to start in order. So your head, you feel crazy. I call it emotional lability. Uh, sometimes I love my husband and the next minute I just want to, <laughs> I want to slap him silly. And then you can have night sweats and hot flashes, but you can also have changes with vision and the way food tastes and hair growth on your chin, particularly. I found a really nice one just under here the other day. Um, you know, I feel like my husband's hair falls from here onto his shoulders or in his ears. We always find these weird hairs through menopause on our chin, sometimes that one scraggler on our eyebrow, but also even on our nipples, and it becomes sparse in, in, in the pelvic area. Other symptoms include changes in sleep, and then as we move down towards the pelvic area, we can start to have incontinence or leakage of urine, uh, trouble pooping, and vaginal dryness and intimacy issues. So there's a whole host of wonderful symptoms related to menopause, yay! And just remember ultimately that these symptoms um, are perceived in different levels of severity by different women and at different times. So some women will never have intimacy issues. Some women may only have hot flashes. Just because we're talking about it doesn't mean you're going to get all of these uh, problems, but just know that they exist. And as you see here, it's alarming to me that the majority of us will have these symptoms, but the minority will seek treatment. Uh, we women are notorious for ignoring our own health. We care for our aging parents, for our spouses, for our children, for our animals, uh, for our neighbors, for our people and friends at church and work, and we forget about us. And it's time today for y'all to be your own healthcare advocate and speak up. 
I think sometimes women feel like, oh, I don't have time for that. We have time for a lot of stuff, right? Um, we just have to make time for ourselves and it's okay. It doesn't make you selfish. It just makes you reasonable and rational. And I think the other thing that holds us back from the staggering percentage that you see on the slide is I think we're afraid that whatever the doctor tells us, it's mandatory and it's not nothing I do for a living is life threatening, right? I mean, we wet our pants, do the treatment to fix it or not, but wetting your pants is not life threatening. So you don't have to treat that. Similarly, menopause symptoms feel life threatening, but they're not, and you can choose to treat it. You can choose not to treat it, but at the very least choose to go talk about it with a care provider that you trust. So as we kind of go through these symptoms, these changes in menopause and feel these things that are very real, um, we have to remind ourselves that what's on your slide, which is the change in hormones, makes this common, right? It's ubiquitous. We are all going to suffer to some degree through menopause. Again, it may be low on the suffering totem pole. It may be high but we're all going to feel something and it's related to this objective change in hormones. But like I always tell my patients, just because something is common doesn't make it normal, right? Uh, diabetes is also common <laughs> after the age of 50, but that doesn't make it normal. You would seek treatment. High blood pressure is common as we go through our 40s and 50s that doesn't make it normal, you would seek treatment. So again, always keep in the back of your mind during the, this lecture today that we're talking about common stuff, but it doesn't make it normal. So it is okay to seek discussion about it, options for treatment. Don't be shy. This idea of menopause doesn't fully hinge on all the hormone levels you just saw on the screen. It hinges on one thing and one thing only, and that is the absolute cessation of your bleeding. Basically, that means whenever you stop bleeding for 12 months straight, that's menopause. So a lot of women say, don't you want to check my hormone levels? No, I don't. And I can't tell you the last time I've checked someone's hormone levels. And as sassy as it sounds, I don't care. The only thing that I care about as a care provider is how do you feel? I don't need to waste your time and your money checking your hormone levels. I wanna know how you feel. Is it hot flashes? Let's fix that. Is it vaginal dryness? Let's fix that. Is it both? Let's attack them both. So a lot of women make the mistake, understandably guided by poor advice from clinicians, to go have hormone levels checked or their saliva swabbed uh, or ultrasounds and CAT scans done to look at ovaries. And none of those are part of the diagnosis or treatment of menopause. Uh, so be, be wary, be cautious, be hesitant if a care provider is asking to check these things for you. So as you see on your screen, menopause is almost um, the mirror image of puberty, right? We kind of start our periods around the age of 12, plus or minus. They're uh, sparse. Uh, they may come for seven days and then not come for seven months. And the same thing happens when we're about 50, 51 years old. Uh, so you can see up on the screen how these natural changes in our menstrual cycle will occur at around the age of 50, just like they occurred around the age of 12. So like we said a moment ago, the actual diagnosis is 12 months of no bleeding. That is it. It is a totally clinical diagnosis, not based in any laboratory uh, data. Some women will say, well, I had some spotting back in February. Well, that counts as a period. So technically you're not menopausal yet until it's next February. So data suggests that women with three months of no bleeding whatsoever around the age of 50, right, can expect menopause to occur fairly soon. But basically it can take a decade for us to go through the perimenopausal period. 
Um, and this is important because menopause equals loss of estrogen. And with that comes bone loss and bone loss leads to hip fracture and other problems that are the main killers of women after menopause. I always say God gave me estrogen, so it, it ain't that bad. Now it can be bad in certain types of cancers that are driven by estrogen, but it doesn't make all estrogen for all women bad or evil or evil. Uh, so you can see here this real complicated graph up on the screen. Um, and up on the screen, right in the middle, there's that vertical column right in the middle that says menopausal transition. Uh, so it's variable. Uh, it can take a few years. And some women uh, listening to this session tonight may find themselves in early or late perimenopause, uh, where, again, your periods may be longer. They may be heavier. Uh, and there may be more time in between them. Uh, and you can see where uh, towards the bottom of that graph, your hormone levels start to change and how your symptoms start to kind of rev up. Hormones take a dip, symptoms uh, start to rise. And uh, so our general approach to evaluation, it's really basic. We just want to talk to y'all. <laughs> uh, the first thing, of course, is to always rule out a pregnancy test. I know it sounds silly, but it's not unheard of for women in this perimenopausal time frame to get pregnant. We may think, oh, we haven't had a period for a few months and then, ooh, whoops, a daisy. Uh, so always want to rule out late pregnancy. Uh, but some women do keep a menstrual calendar and that's really helpful uh, to kind of see where we're at uh, in approaching the menopause. And then some women keep a diary of hot flashes, night sweats, uh, also any intimacy, discomfort, vaginal dryness, pain during sex, and those sorts of things. But like we said earlier, um, there was this SWAN study, and this was funded by the NIH, and it was really looking at um, lots of different women over a long period of time kind of studying the elements of menopause and we just realized in the end that there is no hormone level we need to check no blood work that needs to be done no biopsy of the uterus or ultrasound of the ovaries that need to be obtained uh, so again be leery of any care provider who's recommending that it's unnecessary unless they're using it as a way to um, monitor another medical diagnosis like bone loss or cancer. Uh, so the evaluation may be uh, sorry. Is my video back up? Y'all sent me a message. The video was temporarily off. Is it back yes, up? It is. Okay, sorry about that. Thanks, y'all. Thanks for the message. Um, so, uh, sorry, just to take a step back, um, the evaluation of menopause, again, doesn't include hormone levels or blood work or ultrasound, uh, but it's still uh, maybe a little different in what we check, uh, especially based on age. As you can see here, really that uh, early menopause, early 40s, uh, genetically, you may be on track to have early menopause. Um, we know our smokers go through early menopause. And if you're in that young age uh, in which I find myself, you always want to do that pregnancy test, check the thyroid, check any sort of prolactin levels uh, from those glands. Uh, and then any other laboratory data really would be based on the clinician's suspicions uh, after they talk to you and do an exam. Sorry, y'all. I'm trying to. <laughs> okay, hopefully the slides are moving now that we got the video up. So there are special populations. I know that we just had um, a, a message from one of our listeners tonight that there are special populations, including women who've had a hysterectomy. Uh, so I'm just looking at the message that we received tonight. And any woman who um, had a hysterectomy, which really just means removal of your uterus, you um, technically are diagnosed as menopausal, right? Because no matter how young you are at the time of your hysterectomy, you could be 30, but you don't have any more periods. And so technically no more bleeding means menopause. 
But I think what's really interesting about our listener's question tonight is that she still has her ovaries. And that's important because her ovaries at a young age are still protecting her from bone loss, osteoporosis, and heart disease, and keeping her sex drive and libido going, and ultimately preventing early hot flashes and night sweats. So a lot of women who are listening tonight may have had a hysterectomy for uh, what we call benign reasons. You had heavy bleeding, you had benign fibroid tumors, no cancer was involved. Um, and because of that, you got to keep your ovaries. So technically menopause, cause no period, but your ovaries are still working and, uh, and doing beautiful things for you. So great, great question. Other sp special populations would be women on contraception. So personally, I do take a low dose uh, hormone contraception. Uh, I don't want to be pregnant at 43. <laughs> that scares me. Um, but uh, because of that, I don't have a period at all. So that is something that's suppressed through uh, the medicine that I'm taking. And there are other non-hormone medications that can suppress your period. So there are some anxiety, depression medications. There are some things that manipulate your steroid levels or your um, or other uh, hormone levels, uh, the things that we talked about like thyroid, and that can change your period. So very good questions. So now that we've talked about the evaluation, which is really just clinical and not laboratory, uh, it's a really good idea to move into management. I love management. I think I like micromanaging my husband and my kids. Um, but if you look at this chart, you may feel overwhelmed, as do I, because there's a million options out there. And most of them, if you look up here, are, are, are hormonal. Um, and that's for a reason. Menopause is the loss of hormones. So to correct a lot of the symptoms, we need hormone therapy. Doesn't mean you have to use those things, uh, but they are all listed here. So if I had a dollar for every time I got distracted, hmm, I wish I had some ice cream. Um, this is how our minds work in menopause. Um, it's again, a reflection of puberty. It's a mirror image. And so if we thought we were easily distracted as, as a teenager, uh, oh, just wait for menopause. Um, but, uh, distraction and cognitive function are those first elements of the menopause kind of, uh, path of symptoms. So remember a moment ago, we started with our head and we went all the way down to our vagina. Uh, so we'll start with cognitive function again. But some of the uh, associations we see based on the literature uh, does say that the decline in estrogen uh, does correlate with the decline in, in your brain function. Um, but there's not enough research to say taking estrogen improves that. So this may be one of the categories tonight where I would not recommend estrogen uh, to improve it. So here's another category that we talked about. The husband says, I keep finding these things all over the house and there are just a bunch of skeleton bones, right? And the wife says, well, my doctor says bone loss is normal at my age. So like we said earlier, even though these things are common does not make them normal. So uh, a really good cartoon to remind us that bone loss is common, but never ever normal. Uh, and so we do see bone loss more commonly in obese women uh, with the stress. Uh, improvement has been shown, though, in symptoms of joint pain, stiffness, bone loss uh, with some of the hormone therapies that you see listed there. So some women cannot take oral estrogen by mouth, like tablets, uh, for certain reasons. So they can certainly wear a patch, which is transdermal estrogen therapy. And that transdermal patch of estrogen is low dose and very effective to improve bone loss. Um, let's see. Okay. So the next category is hot flashes. Some of y'all call them hot flushes. It may be a difference in me being Southern. I'm not sure, but we say hot flashes and I'm having one right now. Uh, but this 
cartoon always reminds us that Carol finds her own way of coping with hot flashes and she stuck her whole body in the refrigerator. And we do sometimes do that, right? So we just open the freezer and stand there. I was laughing with Janelle because my uh, family, we just got back last night from Disney World and it was magical and wonderful and a thousand degrees in Florida. But um, the hotel was amazing because it was so cold. I don't know if y'all have ever stayed in a hotel uh, where it's like an ice box, but my kids were complaining uh, and I was in heaven. It felt amazing to be that, that cool while I was sleeping. Uh, it sounds like it was my favorite part of Disney World, but <laughs> I promise it wasn't. Um, and so with bone loss, uh, excuse me, with hot flashes and night sweats, again, this can occur daytime, not just at night, but you might have that profuse sweating around your temple, uh, in the cleavage or under the bosom and in the groin area. And it can be so intense that you you literally feel like someone lit a match within your soul. And that gives you a feeling of anxiety and heart palpitations. Um, these t on average last five years, but they can last the entire 10 years of that menopausal transition period. And as you can see here, I mean, one out of 10, uh, I think still has them after the age of 70. And that's real real information and I think a lot of my patients are alarmed that they still have hot flashes at the age of 80 um, but they may be in that lucky few. Um, they definitely uh, kind of start suddenly they usually resolve within a few minutes but again they are life altering not life threatening but certainly affect your quality of life. And so you can see here that some of the treatments for hot flashes and night sweats do involve the use of estrogens. Um, and we want to avoid any estrogen pills in women who might have high cholesterol or triglycerides or any woman who has a risk of blood clot or clotting disorder. Uh, we can always use the transdermal estrogen patches or different forms of estrogen to kind of get around those restrictions. And again, this is not a cancer talk. Uh, I do do those for the Cancer Center. So again, my talk tonight is centered around the general population of women, uh, no one uh, in, in particular. So if y'all have questions, please put them in the chat. I'm happy to answer them as we go along. Now, a lot of y'all may still have your uterus and you may think, well, I went through menopause. I haven't had a period in a few years, but I still have a uterus. Can I take estrogen? And the answer is yes, you can take estrogen, but the estrogen hormone thickens the lining of your uterus. So it may help your hot flashes and your night sweats and your mood irritability. It may even help a little bit with your sleeplessness, but we don't want it to cause any hyperplasia or cancer in your uterus. So we always ask our women on estrogen who still have a uterus to add a second hormone called progestin or progesterone. That's the hormone we naturally have had our whole lives that keeps the lining of your uterus thin. So estrogen to help your menopause symptoms, progesterone to protect your uterus from, from the estrogen, right? Because everything has a good and a bad to it. A lot of the studies from the Women's um, Health Initiative uh, from 20, 25 years ago showed that the addition of the progesterone is actually what increases our risk for breast cancer. So the, the research did not show that estrogen by itself increased breast cancer risk, but rather the progesterone. And so we always want to be cautious in using these hormone combinations in any of y'all, but it's a discussion that is a good one to have. Other um, treatments might include these sprays and gels. And so a lot of great pharmacies around here, like Knees Pharmacy or Grant County Drug Store. These are um, Fort Mitchell Drug Shop, I believe. But a lot of these are good mom and pop pharmacies that can actually compound or mix the estrogen in more of a gel ointment emulsion or spray for us. And uh, you might find benefit applying this to the inner thigh area and just rubbing it on your skin kind of twice a day and seeing if that low dose is effective in treating your night sweats and hot flashes. And then finally, we have our non-hormonal options, which a lot of y'all may be interested in. There's no research to say you have to try these first, 
Um, but if anyone has a hesitancy using hormones, uh, personally, I don't. But if you do, these are great options. Mind body um, meditation uh, with or without acupuncture has been proven uh, over and over again to be extremely beneficial in helping uh, women through menopause and menopausal symptoms. But there are other pills and medications such as black cohosh, which is a supplement you can get at a vitamin shop or GNC nutrition store. Um, you can take uh, Estrovin, which is a brand name of a plant-based or phytoestrogen. Comes in a cute little pink box with a green leaf, so makes you think it's natural and amazing. But uh, nonetheless, it's a great over-the-counter option to help with hot flashes and night sweats. And then you can see here some anti-depressants um, uh, can be helpful, like Paxil, and then some neuropathic medications like gabapentin or Lyrica. Some people may use for fibromyalgia or restless leg syndrome, and these are actually helpful for night sweats and hot flashes. Um, clonidin can help with heart palpitations, night sweats, and hot flashes as well. So a lot of great options out there. We've talked about cognitive function, bone loss, hot flashes, night sweats. And now let's talk about kind of that sleeplessness. I always joke that most of the reason I can't sleep is because my husband's kicking and snoring uh, and then the dog needs to go out and I'm 43 and I have a four-year-old and a six-year-old uh, and they're, they're always up to no good and need something as well. Uh, so a lot of us may find as women that there's just other things going on in our lives that wake us up uh, that have nothing to do with menopause. Uh, and it's just our brain working over time and, and our spidey senses, hearing everything and perceiving everything. Whereas my husband could po probably sleep through, you know, World War III. Um, but if we feel our sleep disturbance is really attributed to menopause, uh, that would be common. It definitely happens. It doesn't have to just be because of hot flashes or night sweats. We could just have trouble sleeping. Um, but as you see on the list here, a lot of times it is related to the obstructive sleep apnea. We snore, we can't breathe, we have restless leg. Um, we have heart issues. Uh, we have to pee 10 times at night and don't forget we can fix that per y'all. Um, but there could be an underlying issue and we should address it. And it's not unheard of that women recognize they're in menopause because they have a panic attack. And you may think, oh my goodness, I'm definitely having a heart attack. And in reality, it is just severe anxiety or panic attack. And that can be one of the first signs of menopause and that would cause you to not sleep. That anxiety and depression um, you may have had earlier in your life and it just has gotten considerably worse through menopause. Uh, so you can see here there is that significantly increased risk. Um, but new onset depression is also two times more likely to occur just in menopause. You could have been happy-go-lucky your whole life, and then menopause hits, and and it could be hormonal, it could be you're an empty nester, it could be, you know, I, I look at myself and I think, oh my gosh, where did this muffin top come from? And it makes me depressed, because I just think I apparently can't eat anymore. Um, and you just have those feelings, and that can make us bluesy and even depressed. Uh, estrogen, as you see here, again, alone or in combination with an antidepressant uh, like Paxil or one of the other ones is definitely an effective therapy. There are so many anti-anxiety and antidepressant medications on the market that um, it's not my specialty, so I probably would not be the best person to ask questions about that, but just make sure a takeaway point from tonight is that y'all know the antidepressants can be helpful in menopause, uh, especially if you're looking to avoid hormone therapy in menopause. And uh, since we've started with cognitive function and we kind of moved our way down the body, we now find ourselves at uh, the vagina, uh, my favorite, right? So as a pelvic reconstructive surgeon, uh, we're always treating the bladder issues, the vagina issues, and the rectal issues for our women, particularly around menopause. 
Vaginal dryness is very common. Uh, we really feel like it's one of the main forms of female sexual dysfunction, and it rates at 40% among women who report it. We feel like it's underreported, and that's probably because Again, it's an intimate issue that not every woman wants to talk about, uh, like, like me. Um, but high prevalence, it can cause burning with or without intercourse, itching with or without intercourse, pain to just kind of sit or wear tight-fitting pants with or without intercourse. Um, but uh, some of the things you might see when you look down there with a mirror is pale skin. But you can also see very red skin, very red you can start to think, oh, I used to have little labia and big labia, and now I just have like one labia. Um, and that's because the atrophy or the loss of uh, tissue sturdiness just makes it all one thin, lackluster <laughs> blob. I call it the Ken doll effect, uh, Barbie doll effect. But we also start to lose our pubic hair and there's no elasticity and the skin becomes very slick, smooth and shiny. I've had women always say to me, I touched down there and it felt really rough and bumpy and that's scary. And I always remind them that that's amazing. We love the vagina tissue inside to be rough and bumpy. That means you have good hormones. That means it can stretch. If you think about the vagina like a skirt with pleats in it or with an elastic waistband in it, there's more give to the fabric that has folds and that has pleats versus the skirt that's made out of pleather or, you know, leather. Uh, there's no give to that slick, stiff fabric. And so we want our vagina to have rugue or folds and be rough and bumpy. Um, but during menopause, we lose that integrity and structure. So some of the treatments for vaginal symptoms uh, really center around putting the thing in or on your vagina. I have a lot of women come to me and they said, my gynecologist put me on the estrogen patch and my night sweats are better, but my vagina is still dry. And if you think about it, y'all, that makes total sense. When your hands are dry, do you slap a patch on your arm? No. You put the lotion right on your hands and you rub it in and it makes them supple and moisturized and looking good and feeling good. So if your vagina is dry, why would you slap a patch on? Put the lotion on the vagina and make it better. So the uh, obviously one of the best treatments is estrogen. And so we're really looking to use vaginal estrogen and when you look up at the slide you can see that estrogen for the vagina comes in a small flexible ring that you can gently insert it also comes in a cream that you can rub with your finger just like any other lotion or in an, a little gel capsule that you see in the picture here and you can easily insert that with a finger you don't need applicators for any of the things i just mentioned and then finally, there's something called a serum. And a serum is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. Some of you may have had breast cancer who are listening tonight, and you've taken a serum called tamoxifen. So there are things like tamoxifen, arimidex, um, anestrozole, and these medications after cancer treatment, they get rid of all the estrogen in your tissues, but they're selective right? So they're selecting the breast tissue. This one you see on your screen is selecting estrogen in your vagina, meaning it's going to allow estrogen to replenish itself in your vagina, but block the estrogen from your breast and other tissues. Uh, so it's considered fairly safe since it's um, ospimethine and this Serum is not a true estrogen, right? It's a fake estrogen. But this particular pill, you swallow one a day and it can help vaginal dryness, pain during sex, and atrophy. If you remember from the previous slide, again, we were talking about estrogen creams and inserts like the uh, ring or gel capsule. Um, but we can also do number three that's listed, and those are laser therapies. And so we have this one called Thermiva. 
And then we have this one called Mona Lisa Touch. Mona Lisa is a, is a CO2, it's a laser. And so we insert this in the office. I know, don't be scared. <laughs> it's all safe. It takes about five minutes to gently laser and resurface the skin on the inside of your vagina lumen or vagina tube. And uh, you can eat breakfast, drive yourself, get this five minute procedure and then go about your day. Um, this typically, uh, the laser does lead to a little discomfort for the first 24 hours and some discharge that may look a little bit like coffee grounds for a day or two. And for that reason, most women avoid sex right away. Um, but you can resume intimacy um, pretty soon, pretty soon. This particular insert in the vagina is also an office procedure. We don't currently offer at St. Elizabeth, but it uses radio frequency, which is almost like your microwave. So basically it kind of brings water back into the surface of your vagina and kind of plumps it up. And that can help with discomfort and dryness during intimacy. Again, a very quick office procedure with very low risks, uh, return to intimacy right away. Now we skipped over um, number two on the list. So just to go back to that, number two are over the counter options, right? So you don't need me to help you get that, but there are moisturizers that you can purchase online called Vaginius and Luvenia among a million others. And then there's some over the counter at Walmart, Walgreens, and any of your local pharmacies called Replens and Refresh. These are literally just lotions. That's it, just lotions. So if you think about it, girls, there's a huge difference between moisturizers or these lotions, right? And lubricants. Lotion is your medicine. It's everything up on the slide, everything up on your screen. It's your medicine. You're using it every day, just like you put lotion on your body or your hands or your face every day when you get out of the shower. But lubricant, that is something you only use when you have sex it's, or maybe you have sex every day. I don't know, but you really only want to use the lube during the act of intimacy. And so please, please, please understand that there's a huge difference between lotions and lubricants, completely unrelated. And it's okay to use both. I do. So, all right. So now let's talk about other forms of menopausal sexual discomfort. You know, we always want our patients to feel what's written on the screen. I want to educate, enhance your experience, encourage you to seek out conversations and options. We want to stop the pain that women have uh, during intimacy through menopause and after. Uh, so this, um, Cartoon says, oh, hey, honey, I, I'm, I'm guessing you are not in the mood. <laughs> and so, yeah, she's covered in a bear trap uh, and there's an electric fence between them. And sometimes we feel like that. We're just not in the mood because we know it's going to hurt and it's going to be painful. And that's the result of menopausal changes. So everything listed here are the things I recommend for this condition. Counseling is a beautiful thing. We seek counsel at our churches um, from from our you know i have a pastor some of you may have a priest or a father or um, someone that you seek religious counseling from uh, we also have a financial counselor a lot of us uh, really ask someone who specializes in that to help guide us with retirement planning so we should have a counselor for intimacy if it's a concern during menopause we have amazing counselors in the area. Emma Schmidt is just one of my favorites and she's amazing. But you can find any legitimate counselor at this website here on the slide. Pelvic floor physical therapy is offered at St. Elizabeth. And if your back hurts, you would get a massage. If your knee hurts, you would get physical therapy. Some of y'all might be doing physical therapy for your heart. So why not do physical therapy for your lady parts? Uh, we have five certified uh, doctorates of pelvic therapy and they're just incredible. And again, you only have time for what you make time for, right? So I always hear that excuse, I don't have time or it sounds weird or how much does it cost? And I always look at my patients and say, you know, don't come complaining to mama if you ain't willing to do something about it. 
And sometimes we do have to put forth a little effort to make whatever the menopausal complaint is better. But you can certainly continue therapy with your uh, primary care doctor and consider yoga, meditation, uh, other uh, group sessions through your gym or church. Uh, these are all really great outlets and avenues uh, to pursue for just general therapy uh, for, for de-stressing in life because that can help a lot of medical ailments. There are other things that can help with pain or lack of um, arousal and blood flow during intimacy. And those would be uh, FDA approved stimulators. A lot, of, uh, a lot of us may find as we go through menopause that our husbands go through menopause and they have changes as well. They don't maintain an erection during intimacy. It's difficult to get an erection. They might've had cancer as well. We have cancer that removes our parts, our boobs, our ovaries, our vaginas, and they may have cancer that removes part of their penis and makes erections hard uh, for them to get and maintain. They may use penis pumps, and on the screen you can see some pumps for us. These help our lady parts to bring back blood flow and engorgement and make the act of intimacy improve. Uh, there are other hormone therapies like testosterone, not just estrogen, and these hormones can improve our sex drive, but also our arousal and ability to orgasm. Menopause is notorious for taking away our desire and muting that orgasm. And so we can uh, use these treatments to bring that back. Uh, there's been some talk about the Viagra for women. Uh, I would say don't do it. Uh, I'm not a huge fan. It's also not proven statistically significant uh, through research. But there are some herbal uh, supplements over the counter uh, that if you have a nutritionist or a homeopathic care provider, they can always guide you with those. And then sometimes, like we spoke earlier, antidepressants like Wellbutrin or Lexapro can not only help anxiety and depression, but also they don't affect your sex drive or libido. We mentioned things like Paxil earlier, and those medications may help your depression, but they do take away your sex drive. Same for men and women. And so sometimes just having that conversation with your primary care provider about changing your antidepressant to something like this really may help. Now, I don't know how many of y'all have heard about um, the two medications here at the bottom, but there are two FDA approved medications for the um, sex drive uh, right before and during menopause. They're not approved for postmenopausal women, but I use them in postmenopausal women in, in my practice. Uh, so I just wanted to disclose that they were never researched in postmenopausal women. Um, it is approved in Canada and pretty much everywhere else, just not in America. Um, but we still use Addy, the pill, and Vilesi, the injectable, for low desire and low arousal. The pill is something you take every day, and it changes the serotonin levels in your brain. And the injectable medicine at the bottom is something that you give yourself through an injectable pen about one hour before every episode of intimacy. So one injection, one hour before one act of sex. And these affect, again, your serotonin, your brain. And that's what we need as women is sometimes to get out of our own heads. Um, and that's why counseling and medications such as these on the screen are so helpful during menopause. This is a picture of Addy or Flabanserin. And this is the pill you take every day for low desire, low arousal. And this is a picture of the injectable bremelanotide called by Lisi. And again, this one injectable pen is used one hour before one episode of sex. So just a little blurb about the dysfunction. Sometimes uh, low dose hormones can be very helpful, but we, we want to always invest in physical therapy, behavioral therapy, and treating any underlying disorder that may be causing these changes. It may not just be menopause. So in summary, menopause, hmm. So what you are saying is that I'm to look forward to 10 years of hell followed by death. Am I missing anything? 
And so we don't have that to look forward to. Um, but I hope what we have to look forward to is the fact that uh, the medical community is really rallying around their number one consumer, which is women. Uh, we consume the most health care. Uh, health care companies, insurance providers are really realizing this and starting to develop treatments for us through menopause. They may not be paying for them yet, <laughs> but, um, but that is a, certainly, this is an avenue that's progressing every day. And for that, I am grateful. A lot of the things we use every day in our practice at the Edgewood Women's Center uh, are listed here on the screen. So inserts, creams, rings, over-the-counter medications like Estrovin, antidepressants like SSRIs, these are such great options. And just remember ultimately that what you choose is your decision and you have to be your own advocate. Uh, be open to discuss these options with your doctor or nurse practitioner. Don't go in closed off. Uh, it's always better to be willing to discuss all the options so then you feel confident and comfortable in the decision that we come to together. And just remember that ultimately some of the treatments that are hormone-based may increase our risk of blood clots, cancer, stroke, but it's so rare. I usually reassure my patients by just reminding all of you that if hormones were that evil, think about all the 18 year olds on birth control, quite frankly, they may um, be at the same risk and yet they are not dropping like flies, so to speak, right? We have healthy women taking healthy forms of hormone. And so we are also women who are healthy enough to take those. And the benefits are clear, reduces our risk in other cancers, heart disease, hot flashes, night sweats, lowers our death or mortality rate and helps to reduce bone loss, which is a main, uh, the, the thing that threatens us uh, in our lives in menopause. So good risks to discuss, good benefits to talk about, great options. Uh, it's almost overwhelming at times for me to think about all the amazing treatments that we have out there. Um, it's tough to squeeze it into an hour session tonight. And as you can imagine, tough to squeeze into a 15 minute appointment at my office. Uh, so I hope, I hope I've covered uh, the majority of what y'all wanted to hear and learn about. Uh, many stones were left unturned tonight. So I appreciate y'all's kindness and patience in realizing that uh, this was one hour and I tried my best to squeeze it all in. Um, but I, I really sincerely appreciate y'all's time and attention. And I would love to take uh, your questions right now if anybody has any. And are you open to uh, people unmuting and asking a question as well, Dr. Oakley? Absolutely. If y'all feel so bold, again, nothing bothers me, but if y'all feel so bold as to speak in front of the group, I welcome it. Do not feel shy. I think we're all women uh, with the willingness to learn from each other. And sometimes hearing that open question helps others. So I have I, the I, option. Oh, sorry. You yeah, I'm looking, at, no, no, I'm looking at direct. Yeah, I'm getting, getting some right. direct messages. So, but feel free to interrupt me. Please, please, please unmute. But we did have a direct question from one of our uh, listeners tonight. Uh, do I recommend discussing symptoms with a gynecologist or primary care doctor? That is a great question. You know, I think we're really blessed here at St. Elizabeth Healthcare and St. Elizabeth Physicians to have really amazing generalists. Uh, servicing the Northern Kentucky region and beyond. And uh, a lot of the ones I've come to know over my last, you know, eight to 10 years here um, are adept at answering your questions about menopause. Uh, you know, some of my closest friends are Gina Grove and Stacy Bishop, and uh, those are great generalists among others uh, that I'm, I haven't mentioned that you should feel comfortable discussing your menopause symptoms to. Um, but our all of our OBGYNs here at St. Elizabeth Physicians um, are also uh, well trained and certainly able to address your concerns and answer your questions. So great, great question. Um, Let's see. Uh, oh, <laughs> so someone said to put a plug in for the podcast. <laughs> I think you should. And I appreciate that. For two years now, I have done the Lady Bod 
podcast for St. Elizabeth Healthcare. And, and the new episodes are released every Wednesday and you can find those on iTunes, Spotify, or Podcast One, wherever you get your podcast. It's free to listen to. And it's just Holly Morgan from the Mix 94.9 radio station and me. And we just, we just yap. We complain about our kids and our husbands and we talk about wet in our pants and menopause and mental health and anything in between. So I'm glad we have a listener tonight. So thank you for listening to the podcast. I appreciate it. Excellent. Um, I'm trying to see. I'm taking a peek. Okay. I don't have any other uh, questions coming up, but y'all type away. Don't be shy. Yeah, please don't be. And um, while, while you're typing your questions, um, we are going to be asking for your feedback and input um, from tonight's presentation. So please be looking for an email of uh, from CrimeWise on Thursday. Uh, and it will be a SurveyMonkey link. Uh, it's our evaluation. And so it's very important to us that you complete that survey when you get it. Uh, so, uh, and then we additionally will send you an email when, as I mentioned, uh, this session was recorded when we actually have that link up on our, um, on our webpage. So, so we'll do that as well. Well, um, have you gotten any more? Questions? No questions. Y'all be careful. If you give me an eight, nine, or 10 out of 10, uh, you may have to listen to me give another presentation again next year. <laughs> but, one of uh, our favorites, you can tell. <laughs> but you may not want to. So then rank it like one or two on the survey. <laughs> uh, but no, no questions so far. So um, just feel free if you had a question about cognitive function, uh, short-term memory loss, if you had a question about bone loss or bone uh, screening, uh, you know, this was menopause focused, but we can certainly talk about, I can answer questions about appropriate screening for bone loss, uh, mammogram, colon and rectal cancer screening, pap smear screening, all of those. Um, trying to see if there's any other questions. Uh, oh, okay, a couple questions coming through. Um, Oh, yeah. Okay, so great. Uh, you know, someone brought up the fact that there's all these external forces right now. Um, and that is so timely to discuss COVID. I, we have had uh, big jumps in the rates of anxiety and depression in the last year and a half really related uh, directly to COVID. And whether you might be one of our listeners tonight who's been directly affected because you had COVID or just you couldn't leave the house because of it, or you just felt scared to leave the house or you couldn't see your kids or grandkids or, or aging parents. Um, you know, one of our listeners tonight mentioned just working with COVID patients um, in some capacity at just being involved in St. Elizabeth Healthcare. And that can absolutely be uh, crippling. Uh, it's exhausting. Um, to think about. It's exhausting to uh, come to work and um, a year ago feel uh, really supported and that we were revered and, uh, you know, it was an honor and people were like, yay, healthcare workers. And then in the last six months, they're like, you know, I had an email that said, said die, you communist scum to me, an email to me because I supported vaccinations. And I think uh, without a political conversation tonight, you know, it's been really overwhelming for the past year and a half, uh, no matter what side of the fence you're on with vaccines or politics. I think the whole situation around COVID can certainly prompt us to feel anxious, depressed, uh, regardless of menopause. So again, it doesn't have to be hormonal, but it can be a little bit of all of everything. Um, uh, question to, uh, let's see, how do we increase cognitive function? Uh, yeah, I'm still waiting on that like magic pill. <laughs> I, my first bit of advice is don't have children. I'm kidding. <laughs> but sometimes I do feel like my children absolutely removed the majority of my brain cells uh, before menopause started. Um, but, you know, the research has proven over and over again that just keeping your brain active is just as healthy to prevent cognitive decline as keeping your body active is at preventing physical decline. Um, so I often hear from my patients, you know, well, I just sit at home and watch TV. That does not keep your mind active. So great question, but the research has proven that all those 
people uh, doing the Sudoku puzzles in the waiting room and on the you know public transportation next to you, they're doing the right thing. They really are. Um, but a lot of times, uh, currently in medical in the medical field, we just don't know how to stop genetics. And, and that's a huge thing, but great question. So we also have a question about addressing weight gain. Um, who girl, I get asked this all the time, all the time. Um, we typically gain five pounds per year uh, during and after menopause, and it's directly related to the lack of estrogen um, and the changes in our hormones. And so I always laugh that things get worn out, right? My cell phone gets worn out. My car gets worn out and our body, it gets worn out. I mean, I have those friends and I think, oh my God, they don't have a wrinkle. They still have a flat stomach. And that really is genetics. It really is. But for the most part, our body gets worn out through menopause, just like everything else in our lives. And not only does it get worn out, it gets lower, right? Like my chin is halfway down my neck. My boobs are halfway down my stomach now, and my butt is part of my thigh. It's like one, one whole thing back there. <laughs> There's no separation. Um, and so how do we address this weight gain? I think we have to, number one, ad admit to it. We have to know it's happening, and we have to slap our hand out of the cookie jar. Now, I'm, this is not the pot calling the kettle black, but... Um, I do have to consciously think about it every day and say, I can take all the hormones I want, but until I put fewer calories in that I take out, I'm never going to change that weight gain. And it is tougher. It's tough to have kids at 40, tough to lose that weight, um, but really tough to go through menopause because um, the weight distribution is just all sorts of crazy. Um, but one of the first things you got to do is just watch what we're putting in. I could run 10 miles a day, but until I give up that bottle of wine and uh, that donut, nothing's going to change. Uh, let's see. I don't want to skip any questions. I love that y'all are hitting me up. Um, and then let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. So we have some questions about pain during intimacy. Um, okay. So pain during intimacy. Love it. One of my favorite questions as a sex expert. Um, I love talking about this, but personally I use estrogen cream every night on my vagina. Uh, so estrogen cream has several uh, brands and it doesn't matter which one it does require a doctor's prescription. It is the number one treatment for the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. So we call that GSM and that menopausal syndrome affects how we pee and how we have sex. That tissue down there is just lacking estrogen. It's thin and that atrophy is painful. And that's how we get infections, UTIs, yeast infections, pain during sex. And the number one treatment is estrogen cream. I squirt about a blueberry sized dollop on my fingertip. And then I spread my labia, my lips, and then I rub it right at the opening. I don't go deep inside. Most of the pain that you might be mentioning uh, is what I feel. And that's right at the entrance. Sometimes it feels like, you know, our husband's trying to push his, his penis against a brick wall. And that can be very alarming because we think, oh my goodness, is there something blocking or obstructing him? Am I closing up? And that's rare. It does happen, but very rare. Usually it's just that the skin is so uh, taut, it's so tight that it just has no elasticity, no give to it. And the estrogen is that medicinal lotion or moisturizer that you're going to use every night to make the skin more pliable. Um, so great question there. Uh, again, I'm peeking over my shoulder. Uh, does menopause or aging cause facial hair? Um, not just a hair here or there. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So like a beard or sideburns, even uh, some, some more uh, elaborate chest hair. It is true. And what's happening is we have a little bit of a kick in testosterone. Um, and then we have a, a loss of something called sex hormone binding globulin. It's a really long word, but it's like this little hormone that kind of swims through our bloodstream. And when it sees testosterone, it attaches to it and it soaks it up and takes it away. So we don't have too much of it. Um, it's one of the things that a lot of hormone therapy does. Uh, so 
I'll use a 25 year old as an example. 25 year old has three periods a year. She's overweight. She has acne, some facial hair. It's a syndrome called polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS. And those girls have a lot of testosterone. And if they simply take a hormone therapy, like a, like a birth control pill dose, it will send out that sex hormone binding globulin, soak up all the testosterone, and that will reduce their weight, their um, acne, and their facial hair and sideburns. Um, and so this particular question from our listener tonight, um, you may benefit even around the age of 45, 50, 55 from some low dose hormone therapy, like a low dose birth control pill. Now, we don't want to neglect the fact that pretty immediate growth where you're like, holy cow, overnight I have sideburns, you know, I have mutton chops. That could be a sign of a, a testosterone tumor on your ovary if you still have ovaries. Uh, most of these are benign, but they kind of, when they, when they pop up, they cause an immediate surge in testosterone and that causes immediate growth in facial hair. So um, that may be something you want to discuss with your OBGYN and they may just want to check some of your testosterone levels just to rule that out. But great questions. Um, let me just look. Uh, some jokes about children. No children. Ha ha. Yes. <laughs> my children have ruined my mind and my body, but totally worth it. Um, okay, I think I've covered them all. Great questions. Y'all are awesome. Thanks, everybody. Um, let's see, it's about 7.15. I, I promised my husband I'd go home and help him put the kiddos to bed. So unless there's any last minute question, what do y'all think, Monica, Janellen? So I just want to say on behalf of PrimeWise and uh, our members uh, participating here this evening, uh, we definitely um, thank you. And I think this is that point when we would all, you know, clap. Uh, so hopefully we got the, a couple of reactions going. We have maybe even a standing ovation. We do appreciate you for this very interesting, very honest and enlightening presentation um, uh, on a, a subject near and dear to us. And yet, uh, as we all message you privately, also a very private um, uh, topic. So. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you greatly. Um, again, a plug for uh, the Lady Bod uh, podcast. You will find it interesting and uh, and and very um, fun, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Very fun. <laughs> uh, very fun. And uh, please, 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 when you do get um, an email from us on Thursday, please look for that email from PrimeWise, uh, and it will have a Survey Monkey link. We do ask you to please provide us with that feedback. Uh, and uh, um, including feedback on Dr. Oakley, but uh, PrimeWise as well. So um, I thank each and every one of you greatly. Uh, and um, please have a, a, a great remi remainder of your evening. Yes, thank y'all so much. I appreciate every one of you. Thank you. Bye, y'all. <laughs>